and my mistakes will be preserved for the future. Um, all right. And somebody's asking a question, but I'm not seeing it. If someone would mind, uh, I just want to check, try out how uh, we can do Q&A here. There's a Q&A feature, but I don't think I'm seeing them. Uh, could somebody just uh, type a message into chat to all, uh, make sure I can see through in case there's questions as we go. Here we go. Good question that came in. All right, great. All right, so as we go, feel free to use the Q&A feature. Um, and I will try to answer them as I see them. Uh, if I'm going on and, uh, don't, uh, and I miss something, I will try to loop back around to it. And if I don't get to your question before the end of this thing, uh, I'll try to post a summary out on my blog of questions and answers, or at least uh, what I can come up with for an answer. Um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Morowski. I'm a Microsoft MVP in PowerShell, and I'm a community manager at Chef. And we're going to talk a little bit about building and testing DSC resources today. And I'm going to be a little light on the slides and a little heavy on the demo. So um, please, if you have questions as we go, ask them via the questions feature, um, or feel free to follow up. I run office hours most weeks, um, and uh, that's all available from my blog, which is uh, stephenmorowski.com, which I should just note here. And you can also find links to my stuff off of the PowerShell.org site, of course. All right, let's get going. I just kind of went through this. Um, but prior to, the, prior to my current role, I worked uh, for Stack Exchange as a site reliability engineer. And that's where I spent... The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just glad that the broadcast is starting. So um, prior to that, I worked for uh, Stack Exchange for about a year, at, or a year and a half as there or so and had DSC in production there for, for quite some time. And so I got to uh, bump into a lot of the uh, little hiccups over the various versions uh, going from V1 to V2. And, well, V1 being the preview, V2 being RTM, and then V3 for, uh, being uh, general availability. So there have been three versions that I've been playing with up until the, you know, the official uh, Server 2012 R2 release. Okay, let's keep moving. Just to uh, kind of frame our, ta our talk on resources, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the components of desired state configuration. There's a couple main components. There's the local configuration manager, that's the agent. That's what actually runs the resources and uh, takes the configuration document and uh, calls the different resources to make things look the way you want them to do. Uh, there's a DSL, a domain-specific language, to create those configuration documents that the local configuration manager can use, and that's in PowerShell. And then uh, there's an optional component of a REST pull server, REST-based pull server, for distributing those configuration documents as well as your custom resources. And there's compliance endpoint in with that as well. Uh, those features are, are a little uh, a little bare bones. Um, 
but they help provide a way to uh, actually get your DSC uh, res resources and configuration documents out to your nodes and kind of validate that this all works and, and, and that type of thing. All right. So why do we want to build custom resources? You know, wh why don't we want a solution that's just right out of the box or that, uh, you know, that Microsoft provides? Well, in large part, there aren't a ton of resources out there. there. There's more and more every day. PowerShell team has done five waves of releases of custom resources. Uh, we've had, we have some out at, on uh, the PowerShell.org community repository out on GitHub. Uh, and so, you know, that, that ecosystem is growing, but there's a good chance that your custom environment isn't going to be covered there. The other reason, or another reason that we want to build resources is resources are the most granular level of control that we're going to have for the things that we configure. Uh, we may say we want to configure Exchange, right? How we configure IIS for Exchange is going to be one, is going to be one kind of subsection. How we configure the bindings on, X, on IIS for an exchange is going to probably end up being a resource. And there might be other IIS resources that we could leverage instead. But we want to drive down to the lowest level that we want, uh, the lowest level of configuration that we need to manage. And that's what we want to create resources around. Now for higher level configurations, we have things like composite resources, which we're really not going to delve too much into today, um, but composite resources allow us to group these resources into a uh, little bit more reusable components and provide some parameters, really just like functions. So we just provide a higher level view of those resources. But when we build a custom resource, we want to build a very discrete uh, component that we can, you know, very much like PowerShell, where we have discrete commands that we can build together in a pipeline. We want discrete resources that we can build together into a configuration document to actually uh, drive our infrastructure forward. Resources are also, you know, kind of the base shareable unit that we have. Uh, if you have a resource module, it's something that we can share out with, uh, you know, PowerShell GET or out on GitHub or, you know, uh, tech, uh, TechNet Script Center. You know, there, there are a number of ways that we can share modules, and modules contain resources, and so we have a shareable artifact, whether we're sharing it externally with the world or just internally with our own teams. And honestly, you know your infrastructure best. While the, you know, the PowerShell team is kicking out some resources, while, you know, there's members of the community kicking out resources, you know what you have to manage. And chances are you already have some configuration scripts or things that can be adapted to become uh, DSC resources. So you know your infrastructure best, so you're going to want to build resources that can manage the things that you care about. Now I've said this a little bit before, but resources should be very granular. You know, composite configurations give us a high level view, but we really do need uh, nice discrete functionality because that's what allows us to compose things together. If I have a resource that is a exchange installation, for example, and that, re that one resource handles all of the installation of exchange, I'm either going to have a hundred thousand parameters for this thing or it's going to be very, very narrowly scoped and I'm going to have to do custom resources for, my, for other specific scenarios. So by offering, you know, a very low-level resource, we provide the ability for anyone to kind of compose that into the functionality that they need. All right, we're almost done with slides. So DSC resources are basically PowerShell modules, and they compose three basic functions. Or if you're going to do a binary module, uh, you can do three commandlets, but they have to follow this name. First is get target resource. The second is set target resource, and the last is test target resource. All three of these commands need to have the same parameters. 
That's important. If they do not have the same parameters, you're going to run into problems. Because what happens is the local configuration manager takes the configuration document. And in the configuration document, and we'll look at this a little bit later, the description of that resource has some parameter values associated to it in that, in that MOF document, in that configuration document. Those parameters will get passed depending on what function you want to have happen. If you're calling get DSC configuration, it's going to call get target resource, and it's going to pass those parameters that are in the configuration document to that function. If you are trying to invoke a consistency check so that uh, making sure that everything is, is as it's supposed to be, test target resource is going to get all of those parameters. If things aren't the way they should be, then set target resource is going to get those parameters. So each command, what depend and, and how they use those parameters are going to vary, but they all need to take the same parameter set. So I just mentioned that DSC resources are modules. They are modules, but they're not standalone modules. They actually live inside of a secondary uh, or inside of a host module. So you'll have a, a module at the outside, and that will live on a PS module path, and actually a specific subset of PS module path. Uh, that module then will then have a folder called DSC resources, and, and we'll actually look at the file structure, the file structure, uh, the path, the pathing of that in just a few minutes when we dive into the demo. It'll contain a folder DSC resources, and that folder will contain any modules that are DSC resources. So it's nested in a little on the module. Now I mentioned that this has to be on PS module path and a specific subset of that. Because the local configuration manager runs a system, it needs to be, the, uh, the location of the resources needs to be on a path that your uh, the PS module path that's visible to the system. So environmental variables can have two levels. It can have system level and then user level. And so at the system level, the PS module path contains our dollar PS home slash modules, and that's where the that's where all the modules shipped by Microsoft live. Uh, with the, the modules shipped with the OS live, I should be more specific there. And then. Uh, starting with PowerShell 4, which is where we get desired state config, there is a new location, uh, C, uh, or, uh, basically environmental env environment variables, program files. So if you have uh, the x86, it's not there. It's program files, Windows PowerShell, modules. And those two locations are the only valid locations out of the box. Now, uh, and with PowerShell v4, those are the only valid locations for a DSC resource. There is a bug in, um, in PowerShell v4 that those are the only two locations it will ever look. You can actually add stuff to the system, uh, the system view of PS module path. You could have your own custom directory, but the local configuration manager will not find them in PowerShell v4. That is fixed in PowerShell v5 in the previews that we've seen. Um, so hopefully that won't uh, regress, but uh, as, of, as of now, the previews that are out, you can actually have it on anything that's visible to the system account, any, any PS module path that's visible to the system. All right. Here. So I mentioned the structure of the module. So we have the module folder, then we have a DSC resources module, and then we have a resource containing module. Uh, I'll show you what the, uh, an actual one looks like in the file system. Um, but we have three components. Now, you may see some with only two, uh, but we at least, I, I recommend at least uh, at least three. And the and the one that's sort of optional is the PSD one file, the module metadata file. Uh, the reason that I I like to include this is I've bumped into problems where uh, trying to incorporate a custom resource into your configuration document 
um, hasn't always worked well if the PSD1 file isn't there and, and exporting the three get target resource, set target resource, and test target resource commands. It's not been something that I've uh, been able to repeatedly do on multiple machines, but I like, uh, I just, by default, it's not a lot of work. There's a commandlet to create a module metadata file, so um, it's worth just putting in the module metadata file uh, for your resource module. Then we'll have our PSM1 file, which will contain all of our functionality. And then the more, the, probably one of the more confusing parts of this thing is, is, uh, is the schema.moff document. And these things are all named for the resource module. So if my resource is uh, PSHorg underscore page file, for example, it would be PSH underscore page file dot PSD1, PSH underscore page file, PSM1, PSH uh, org underscore uh, page file that schema dot moth. The schema dot moth document is a document that describes the parameter set for the PowerShell functions for those get, set, and test target resource functions. It describes the parameters in a WMI compatible or SIM compatible way. And so that's it's actually a shim that kind of registers in WMI because uh, DSC, if I haven't mentioned it already, um, is actually built, it's a WMI endpoint. It's a SIM endpoint over WSMAN. That's how the standards-based management stuff works. And the schema.moff is what will translate the parameters coming in from that scheme, uh, from that MOF configuration document into the PowerShell parameters that we need. It's the mapping for those. And so um, we have to know how to create, how to, how to basically change the parameters that we have, the parameter types that we have in PowerShell into these MOF compatible types. And that's what the schema.moff does. Don't worry too much about it. There are tools to help us build this document. You don't have to memorize uh, MOF syntax and the different type mappings. Um, there are tools to help us here. We don't necessarily have to delve too deeply into this. In fact, when I'm creating resources, for the most part, there's one edit that I make to the schema.moff file. And we'll, we'll, sh we'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, one thing I want to call out before we get too far, uh, when you start getting to a production state for, with DSC, versioning is extremely important. Um, it's not so important if you're testing and you're using WMF5, uh, Windows Management Framework 5, because um, they have a that has a debug mode where there's no caching happening. But if you're into a, in a more production mode or you're only on WMF4, versioning of the module containing DSC resources is extremely important. The version of the resource itself doesn't matter. What matters is the version in the module metadata of that host module. So we want to be very, very specific about that um, and increment that as we increase our, or as we uh, make changes to our modules. Last couple slides. How do resources operate? So when we provide a system a configuration document, the local configuration manager will go down the list and it will basically test the resources that we give it with the, with the parameters that we provide to make sure things are in the desired state. If they're not, then it will call the set target resource to get them there. You know, we often hear this, uh, we often hear the term item potence to describe this. Um, Test and repair is really a little bit more accurate, a little bit, a little bit easier for people to understand, and you know, it doesn't sound like you're, you know, doesn't sound like you're talking out of a textbook. So, what we're really doing is we're testing it. If it's not in the right state, then we, you know, then we fix it. And we're going to skip the rest of these here because that's all just what I talked about. Um, We're going to look a little bit at testing with Pester today. 
Uh, what testing tool you use really doesn't matter to me as long as it's as long as you're doing some sort of testing. We're going to talk about testing with DSC resources specifically because these things will once they're out of once they're out of your works off your workstation and out into the world, they will run unattended on machines, probably at scale, and we want to be very certain that the logic that we have in there is what we intend it to be. And uh, testing tools like Pester allow us to uh, create automated ways to verify that things work the way we expect them to. Um, and we can use Pester on a couple different scales. The, the other tool that we're going to touch on in, in relation to building DSC resources is test DSC resource from the DSC resource designer. Um, and the PowerShell team has uh, published this one. And it's really great for validating that our schema.mof document matches our parameter sets, um, that our parameter attributes aren't, aren't causing anything funky, and that, you know, and that the schema.mof itself, if it's even valid to, to, to load and to, uh, to become a DSC resource. So um, we will definitely leverage that command as well. All right, let's look at some code. Um, before we delve into that, any questions? I haven't seen anything crop up. So if, uh, if you want to uh, use the questions feature, and again, feel free to interject those at any point in time. Great. All right. Thanks, Richard. Um, okay. And now, um, now I have a question for you. That before I go on, is the font size all right? Can you guys read that? I can blow it up if need be. Bigger. Okay. All right, now we got some nice, nice large fonts. We can start seeing. I've started now to scaffold out um, a function uh, or a, a DSC resource, and it's So I started, a, I started a module, I called it PSHR, and that module contains a couple of files. Contains a PSD1 document, that's module metadata, and then a PSM1 file, uh, which right now is empty. We also have a DSC resources folder here. And that contains one resource. PSHORG or uh, underscore page file. So today we're going to create a resource that manages our page file. We're not going to get all the way through creating the resource. I want to highlight a couple of points and demonstrate a few techniques. Uh, but this is uh, this is the direction that I'm taking some of the resources that uh, I've built over time. One of the things that uh, that's happened as I've built resources is they've kind of all been this little self-contained thing with all the function, all the helper functions and things belonging to the page file or belonging to the resource. But given that they're contained in a module, 
there's a lot of stuff that we can share with the module or have the module have available and exposed to, for end users of the module in addition to being available to the resource. So we're going to actually put a lot of our shared functionality or target a lot of our shared functionality directly back into that PSH, PSH org module. Um, and actually, Don Jones had a, a pretty good blog post about this on PowerShell.org a little while back uh, around this concept, and it makes a lot of sense to do. All right, so we've got the PSH page file, and let's see what's in that directory. Oh, whoa. Hit the wrong hotkey. So I just have a skeleton right now of the PSH org page file, uh, what that's actually going to encompass. We're going to, uh, don't worry about the naming here so much yet. Uh, I've got it uh, with, a, with a long name to kind of disambiguate it from anything else. And if you look at how the Microsoft resources are, they're structured similarly. But when we use them in a configuration, there's a way to provide a friendly name so we don't have to type the whole, or we don't have to know that whole prefix name. We can actually just supply a short name for it and make that available in the configuration document. Okay. So let's get started. To kick things off, we're going to take a look at what we have in the PSHR page file. Uh, module itself. Right now I just have a skeleton of the module. And at the top here, there are just a couple of sections for uh, prepping it to be uh, internet, uh, localized. And so it's not super important to the functionality part of things here, um, but it is nice to do if it's, if it's a resource that you're going to be publishing out to the world. Uh, a good example of this is actually the page file resource that I published uh, as a Stack Exchange resource. We've got it actually localized into a couple of languages uh, for all of the verbose messaging and help messaging. All right, so the first function we're going to have is get target resource, set target resource, and test target resource. There are some, in order to generate this structure um, and to kind of scaffold out these commands, there is a function that's available from, uh, from our PowerShell.org uh, community repository. There's some tools, there's some modules in there that, that have a bunch of tooling in them. And one of those modules is called the DSC development module. And that module has a command uh, of new DSC resource shell. And that's what actually, I do need to address and fix some of the naming here. Uh, they just, these are commands that have just kind of evolved over time. Um, but this will actually scaffold out the PSM1 file as well as your tests file if you're going to use Pester. And so it'll get you a basic, you know, set uh, a basic get set and test target function. It will drop in uh, the appropriate output type hints for each of the functions. Um, and I've already done a little work here and started putting in some parameter names. Um, but it'll also let you know it includes a little, uh, a little reminder that hey, yeah, you need to return a hash table. Um, by default, though, uh, the ISC does have some snippets around let's see snippets it does have some snippets around a DSC resource provider so if you don't want to use uh, the tooling from PowerShell.org you do have some snippets that you can 
drop right in and have that have some of this scaffolded out for you. It's a little less than what I uh, than what I've got for you, but uh, it will get you started. So the second function we have is our set target resource and our test target resource. And what I've done just to uh, illustrate what the workflow of what happens when a resource is applied, uh, I've just thrown in a couple of write verbose statements here. And we're actually going to package up this resource, push it over to a different server, and run it. Um, I've got a, a v another VM in this environment that we're going to push it over to and uh, actually test applying a configuration against our target resource after we create our module metadata, uh, just so we can see how that actually works. So let's do that. So we've got, we've got our basic module structure. Now we need a PSD1 document, and we need the module metadata. Uh, well, we, uh, that's the module metadata, and we need the schema.moth. So I can use new DSC resource from module from the, from the DSC development module, or the DSC resource designer, which I mentioned from the PowerShell team, has some functions to generate that schema.moth as well. The important part there is that you don't need to craft those MOF documents yourself, so don't let that be a deterrent to actually creating resources. So, new DSC. So just give it to the path to where my resource lives. And it will take a look at the parameter types and create a schema.moth document for me. Let's take a look at what that schema.moth looks like. All right, I promise you a chance to look at this. I'm going to point out a couple of things. And that's it. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time here. So a couple of things that you'll see in all resources. You'll see this class version 1. You'll see this OMI base resource. Uh, those are things that are kind of required here. This is the name of our module. We'll, we'll say class and then the name of our module. This friendly name up top here, this is what we get to put in our configuration documents. So for our configuration documents for this, this is the one edit that I make, uh, is I'll edit the friendly name. And so I'm going to call it C page file. The C convention is community. Um, the X convention is uh, experimental resources from the PowerShell team. And nothing on the end uh, is really, or you know, nothing prefixing it is you know, just a production resource. And if hopefully we don't stomp on each other's names. Not, not super wild about the prefixing strategy, but that's what we have for, for the time being. Okay. So we'll save that. And now I'm just going to uh, copy this to my program files location. And I'm also going to copy it to... Um, my, uh, well, actually, uh, I'm going to copy it to uh, a shared location between these two virtual machines. And then I'm going to copy that from there to my uh, program files location on both machines. Then we're going to create a new configuration document. We'll import our custom resource. Um, if, it's a, if, if our custom resource is not in PS Home modules. If it's not in this location, we do need to use import DSC resource. 
and best practice is do not include it in this location because that can get overwritten at some point. Uh, that, that is a system location controlled by the PowerShell team. So we, we don't stick stuff there. Um, so we're going to we're gonna use import DSC resource. Uh, import DSC resource is not a commandlet. It is a keyword that is only valid in the context of a configuration. So it's a little tougher to discover uh, what's going on with that. So we, we have to specify module name. And we could specify the resource name if we wanted. I just want all the resources in that module available. I declare my node, my page file. Uh, you declare your resource, give it a name, put some values. And then we're going to apply this to the remote node. So let's do this. changed here. Um, oh, uh, sorry, I think I had a little demo fail. I, f I had shut down my other machine. We'll get that thing fired back up here. While we're waiting for that to start back up, if you haven't ever used um, a tool uh, called Vagrant, it's a great little tool for managing virtual environments. Uh, it allows you to define a configuration file. It's kind of like configuration management, but for your virtual environments. Uh, you can also, if you're using Hyper-V, you can also use DSC to uh, do something similar. Uh, and we should be back up and running here in just a few moments. While that's starting back up, oh, it looks like it's back up. All right, let's uh, try running this again. And there we go. So what actually, what happened here? So we generated our mock document that describes the configuration that I showed. Then we ran our check and we can see, you know, the steps that we had start set, start test, end test, start set, and in this case, our resource actually just printed out some keys. Oh, and of course, uh, we have our initial size, maximum size, initial si initial size, maximum size that we're passing in, as well as the verbose parameter being true. So that's what get pa that's what gets passed into our DSC resource. So th those commands actually were or those values were serialized. Now we can take a look at what that configuration document looks like. Um, oh, uh, I was in the other. Let's see, where was this? Oh, system there. <laughs> I forgot to change directories, so let's All right, so now here's the resource document that got generated. You can see, just like in our schema.moth, we have our initial size. 
and we have our maximum size values that were passed. We have a resource ID, which says which module that we're looking for, where it was defined in the configuration document. Here we can see the full expanded name. And there's some additional metadata here that uh, helps us, uh, you know, the module version of the host module and some other uh, data about when it was generated and that kind of thing. But the important part here is this is the document that gets passed over. All of the data types that are passed to our configuration documents have to be able to be serialized to that MOP type and back. And so that's why we have that schema.mop document. All right, let's get to the uh, meat of what we wanted to talk about here and talk a little bit about how we build these resources and how we use testing to uh, make sure that we're building solid and consistent resources. So we're going to go back to our page file PSM1 and we're going to start uh, we're going to start actually taking out some of this test target uh, this test target uh, resource functionality that we you know the shell of a thing that we have in here. And we want something that's actually going to go look at the page file settings and determine whether or not we need to adjust them. So we could start with writing code to do that. However, we want to follow a little more test-driven pattern in this case. And so we're going to write a test first that says what we expect to get back from test target resource. And then we'll write just enough PowerShell to actually make that pass. And we can, we can iterate on that. And what that helps us do is to, build, uh, is to build up this framework that if we make edits to our functions, it can catch those errors. It, it can catch errors if we break how we expect it to behave. And so we're basically defining uh, the expected behavior for our functions as well as what, what our expectations are of the environment that it's running in. So I'm going to say when test target resource, or I'm going to describe how test target resource responds when the page file is set to automatically be managed by the machine. So these strings here, they're just descriptors, so that when we run our tests and we see results, Okay, we have a question here. So you can get a, is there a way to get around how low you can set the frequency time uh, for the refresh on the local configuration manager? The, the shortest time that you can set is uh, 15 minutes. However, if you look at what gets registered or, or how, the, how the local configuration manager is doing that, they're actually registering a scheduled task to go and poke that uh, that sim method that tells the local configuration manager to run. Uh, the, so you could create a scheduled task that does that more frequently if you want. Um, uh, honestly, I, I think every 15 minutes or every half hour is probably sufficient. Um, for testing purposes, yeah, you can speed it up if you want it do that, but for testing purposes you're probably intentionally telling it when to do when to do the the polls. Um, and also as you, if your configurations start to get a little bit bigger, you don't want this thing running all the time. Because it's going to be running all of those tests all the time. And so depending on what you're testing, it might be more or less resource intensive. So does that help uh, So back to our back to our testing here. So I want to say that test target resource responds when it's automatically managed. So I expect that the test should return false. And the result's going to be Uh, 
and we'll pass in our parameters. Initial size, we'll do one gig. Maximum size, one gig. And that should be all we need. I don't care about that. And I do have one problem because I set this thing to false for our other test. So let's just Can I type this morning or this afternoon? Okay. Yeah, I actually uh, swapped out uh, the time zone when I was telling people at work about this uh, session. I said it was happening in Eastern Time, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern, but uh, no, not. it's 11 Pacific. All right, so now when we run our test, and I'll show you how we run the tests in just a second here. I don't need this one right now because that's just an empty shell. So when I run test target resource, I expect that I'll get a false, a false response. It should... Save that and let's run that. I'll run it from PowerShell here. And it's we run it just with a little invoke pester command and I have the pester module on my path, on my PS module path. And we get some red. So when, how test target resource responds, when the page file is set to automatically be managed, it should fail. I expected false, but got back true. No test passing. All right, so what is the least amount of code that I can write to uh, make this thing pass? Well, I can just turn the output type false. That's not going to help. And then, so the next part of the pattern, because that's going to succeed if I save that. Ooh, green. This pattern is called red-green refactor. So now I've got a green test. Do I have a lot of complicated logic that I need to address? Nope. So now I can move on. And my next step, this may seem kind of, I'm spending a bit of time on this. Um, you let, when you're doing these steps, you'd actually go a lot faster um, after you've done this a few times uh, because you know the pattern you want to do. So now I want to look, or now I want to compare. when it's set to one gig. And you'll notice I haven't actually done anything to make this thing work yet. And we'll, we'll see, what, we'll, we'll fix that here in just a second. Now I'll save my tests and hop back over into PowerShell and we'll run these. Now let's clear the screen. And now it should return true. 
So when I go back to my test, when I go back to my test here and to my function, uh, to my test target resource, now I can't just flip it from true to false. Now I actually have to write some code to actually make this thing so I can pass that it's true when my page file is set to a gig and it's false when it's not. And so that, this is where then I, I'm going to start writing some code. So I'm going to start writing something like and I'm, and I'm going to drop in a bit more functionality than uh, I would normally take at a, take at a time here just uh, just due to uh, time constraints, but uh, let's paste well, isn't going to work properly for me. All right. Let's, All right, so I'm going to grab a couple of things out of WMI that are going to help me determine whether or not my page file is what I want it to be. So, first thing I need to do is I want to check that if ensure is present, because if, if I don't want my page file to be a certain size, if I want it to be automatically managed, then I wouldn't say ensure, present, uh, ensure absent. So I want to ensure present. Then I want to check if I have a automatically managed page file. which is a uh, Boolean value, so I can just say if it. Let's start with the assumption that things are, are in the state that I want them to be. So if I want to s declare my page file size, then if it's automatically managed, it's false. So and if it's not, it will be true. So that should probably be enough to satisfy my test. For the first case, so let's see if that works as we expect. And it works for the first case like I thought because my system page file is set to automatically managed. But it still fails on my second test. My second test is when the page file should be set to one gig. Now, here's the key thing that I want you guys to remember. The reason that we write these tests is so that we can test the stuff kind of in isolation. And I'm running down on time, so um, I'm going to focus on, on this last particular bit of how we can test these resources. But we want to isolate that. Uh, we want to isolate them from running so that when I run and test all this stuff, it doesn't change the state of my machine all the time. And Pester gives us a way to do that, um, and it's called a mock. And so what that means is I can basically 
provide a substitute for commands that run inside of my function. So in this case, uh, get wmi object is something that I want to mock out because I don't actually want to look at my computer system. I want to control those inputs. So I can pretend to have whatever page file settings I want so I can test the variety of different scenarios that I might have. So um, we're going to do something like Tester has, has a function called mock. And I'm going to say I can mock by the command name, but then I can also look at things like I can also look at things like the parameters that are passed in. And then I can mock it with, I can tell it what to actually return. So let's run this and I should still, I should get what I, I should get what I expect. Uh, so how do we make that work for part two here? Well, for part two, we can actually tell the system that we want to have different output from get WMI object. In this case, I want the automatic page file to be set to false. and that my return values are one, uh, are, are one gig. So is this going to fix things for me? Let's find out. Let's clear off the screen. We got a lot of, a lot of stuff on there. All right, it succeeds, but it's still not quite there. So we have a few things ahead of us yet because we haven't actually validated that the initial size and the maximum size match. So we'd, we'd be able to come in, we'd write some more tests around that to actually, hey, is this actually one gig or not? Right? And so we can build up this suite of tests. Where this comes in handy is in when you need to add some additional functionality or you need to change the behavior. Uh, you can be sure that it's not affecting other commands in, in that. Or if it is, you can figure out what you need to change elsewhere. Uh, by isolating it from the system components, it means that if I give you a suite of tests to run, then you can at least validate that my logic is as I expected without changing the state of your local system before you have to do anything. So a suite of tests is a good thing to have and to pass on with a DSC resource, especially if it's something you're going to share out with the public. But even more importantly, because we run these things, you know, by themselves, unattended, regularly, being able to have confidence in that the logic in them is doing what we expect it to do is a very good thing. Uh, with that, I'm bumping up against time. And so I'd like to thank you guys all very much for, uh, for coming out and spending a little bit of time talking about this with me. And if you have questions, feel free to uh, hit me up on Twitter, um, at Stephen Murawski, or via my blog, uh, stephenmurawski.com, or via PowerShell.org and the DSC forums. So, again, thank you guys very, very much. If you have any questions, too, towards the end here, I'll hang out for a few minutes and uh, see if I can't answer any of those.
I'm not seeing any questions popping up, but I'm going to give it a few more minutes, and then uh, then we can wrap it up. But there's uh, there's still a handful of people. Oh, there here comes one. All right. Hey, thanks, John. Uh, so, do I know what can cause the WMI provider host to hang while a configuration is applying? Um, so, there are a couple of um, there are a couple of possible scenarios. Um, if your um, because you're running in um, in, in a power in, in a WinRM session, so it's not it's similar to PowerShell remoting. Uh, there are thresholds, there are uh, memory limits, and there are runtime uh, timeouts. So there's a lot of things at play that could be monkeying with things. Um, and also, uh, depending on the resources that you're hitting, they might have different timeout values. Uh, so if you're running as local system, and so if you're trying to if you're trying to access a share, for example, that you don't have rights to. It might not be a fast fail, um, and other than that, I mean, it, you know, other than you know, maybe some of the timeouts or memory caps that you're hitting, uh, they might be hitting. Uh, without knowing the resource, it's really tough to say what else specifically might be doing it. Maybe if you're, uh, there's also a maximum number of processes that you can spawn, so uh, so that there could be you know a maximum number of try uh, or uh, of processes or threads that can be spun off by uh, by the local configuration manager. So, um, and again, that's a that's a, a WinRM setting. So, hopefully, I know it wasn't much of a direct answer. <laughs> I'm probably not what you were hoping for, but uh, that's about all I got on a, a general hang issue. Uh, yes. So pretty much all of those settings in WinRM are configurable. Uh, just uh, pop into your WS man drive uh, localhost. Uh, some are at the top level, some are at service, and some are at the plugin level. Uh, I, I'm actually doing a bit of work around that right now uh, myself uh, as far as how our knife, uh, the chef knife command works with WinRM. And so I've been digging through those parameters and stuff. Um, I, I'm going to have a few blog posts about that very soon. Um, but yeah, there, uh, there there's a lot of uh, configuration settings that you can twiddle with. Um, and start by exploring the WS man uh, localhost drive. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks for thank you for uh, coming out. Appreciate it. All right. The last thing um, I will show before uh, before I hang this up is if you want to talk to me further about any of this stuff, uh, I can be found. I have office hours available at ohours.org, and if you're uh, lucky enough to be at Tech Mentor next week, I have a three-hour session on this topic, so I'll be diving much deeper into the topic of building DSC resources on Thursday at Tech Mentor in Redmond. Um, so hopefully I'll see some of you there. Yeah, wow, that's taking a lot of load. If the uh, our sites not having a good day, but uh, ohours.org, um, you can find me, Stephen Morowski, on there. Uh, it's also linked up on my blog, like I said, but uh, usually Wednesdays and Fridays I keep some time open for office hours. 
Uh, with that, thank you guys very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.